All right, so welcome everyone, um, and thank you so much for joining us in our large lecture lunch for the semester. This group actually came out of the learning community that started about 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, records go back to 2000. Yeah, yeah. 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 15 years. Mitch, you were in the first year. Yeah, I did. <laughs> so, so. And we are, those in the room have already heard, but those of you online might just be joining us. And we are piloting a format of hybridness to try to get the best of the affordances of each space. And we're also recording it because we know that many of our lecturers can't come today because a meeting was scheduled after this one um, that brings them into a different space. So. Thank you everyone for going with the flow. <laughs> and thank you so much, you Miguel, for joining us and being willing to share about your course. There was a lot of questions that I'm hearing from folks who um, heard you're doing something exciting and want to know more. Um, so I'm glad that you're willing to share with us today. Um, Miguel's area of research is physics education, and he's an astronomer from Colombia. Um, he's passionate about physics, teaching, and uh, teaching it, and how he can use astronomy to engage the public in science. Hugh is a particle physicist who's been teaching physics from introductory to graduate courses at Tufts for more than 16 years, and he's a strong supporter of self. He's been one of our partners for many years, working on um, our programs and joining our learning communities and discussions of teaching around um, all different contexts and levels. So thank you both, and I will turn it over to you without further ado. <laughs> Hey, thank you. Uh, uh, I'm so, so happy to be here. Uh, this is the first time we're going to be talking, like uh, giving a talk about this uh, and how this unrated uh, large physics class went last semester. Uh, this is the title uh, that you all were invited to uh, come here for. Um, but actually, uh, Hugh and I want to start with a little different kind of vibe. Uh, and if we could, like, retitle the talk it would be something about something around the lines of the parable of the pitterball pitterball uh if you haven't played pitterball is this game that kids play just hitting a ball around a pole and uh that you could like you, it has to go around the pole uh for you to beat your opponent but there's like a, a physics really simple physics question that can come out of this uh game that basically brought the whole phys physics and astronomy department of tufts Upside up, upside down. Like they, they just went crazy when we started asking this question to everyone. And so I want you guys to start getting crazy a little bit with us and literally ask you uh, to um, answer the question. So here's a QR code. You can either go to that uh, website, pollev.com slash nv or you can just scan the, scan the QR code. And the question goes as this. Uh, this is like a simplified version of the terrible question. It goes like, think of a puck moving on a frictionless surface, tied by a string to a peg at the center, and the string wraps around the peg as shown. The really simple question, I'm not saying the problem is simple, but the question is simple. Does the speed of the ball, the linear speed of the ball, increase, decrease, or stay constant as the puck spirals inward? Take a couple of seconds, go with your gut. If you don't have any uh, other way to think about it, think about it a little bit. Does the speed of the puck increase, decrease, or stay the same? Or I think there's another possible answer, which is, does it, does it do something else? <laughs> if you think it does something else. We have five or six responses so far. I'm going to give it a lot of, another 10 seconds for you guys to go with your gut. Oh, uh, it's it's still in your, it should still be in your phone. Uh, it's just that it's there. It's, it's like, I, I just need to scroll to show all the options. All right. Okay. I'm going to give five, four, we have 10 answers. Cool. Oh, there you go. Awesome. We have a distribution, not completely even, but clearly not everybody is on the same page. And this is what led for the department to be like upside down and be like, okay, what is happening here? 
So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story of how this question became to be part of the department last semester. It became, uh, it first started with David Hammer, my advisor. He teaches physics 11 over the spring. I'm TAing for him right now. He asked me this question at the end of last spring. He was like, okay, what happens? I was like, oh, uh, I'm a physics ex expert. I know what happens. Uh, my expert gut reaction was if angular momentum should be conserved, therefore, the, if the radius decreases, the speed should increase, right? A lot of people's gut reaction that maybe have taken physics or have not taken physics but have played theater ball uh, <laughs> might have said, I played it and I know it goes it goes faster, right? And I was like thinking those two things may click in my head. I was like, of course, it goes faster, like it increases. And then David asked me the question. He responded <laughs> to me not by telling me you're right or you're wrong. He responded to me by asking me, where does the energy of the puck increasing the speed come from? And I immediately went, <laughs> I had no idea how to respond to that question. I started thinking so much about it. I thought about it 48 hours straight. I did not sleep well. I was really thinking about it. He did not want to give me the answer. I was just coming from all these places uh, uh, of how it like made sense for me that the speed should increase because that's what my physics knowledge told me, right? After a couple of days, I was like, okay, I understand the problem. I know what the right answer is. I got it. I don't have to think about it anymore. Until two months later, Hugh and David, <laughs> Hugh and David asked me to be part of the physics 11 course over the fall. And I was so, so excited. And I got so excited that I was like, hey, I need to ask this question to more people because it got me thinking so much about physics that I want people to be thinking about physics the same way. Uh, or in a similar way, or just ha have discussions about physics. My first subject was you here. The Friday just before classes started, I, we were planning, we were like thinking about how all the course, course should be structured. We were thinking about the syllabus, all the things. And I asked him the question and we just dropped structuring the course, preparing for the course. And we just started talking about the question. And he went absolutely crazy after. After those two months of planning, after those two, uh, after that, the time I asked him the question, he also took two days of thinking about it so much that the way we prepared for the first class was, let's talk about this question. Let's talk about how my process went. And so Hugh did all the slides from scratch saying how he was, uh, how he thought about a question first. Then he took, it took him less than a minute to see like, okay, no, there's something happening there. Like I'm not really sure about. He was perplexed. He was kind of embarrassed because of not really knowing a quick answer to that really simple question or simple simple way of 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 talking about the question. Uh, he then started to model the system, being a little bit confident, but then being like really unsure because he was really not sure about what the correct answer was because there was so many nuances that he was thinking about that he was like even frustrated with being confused about a really simple physics question. And then he went all to do the math that many of us and many students really go do when they think about a physics question, they go about the math. And he was frustrated because he realized that the math didn't really help him answer the question. And I went through all of that over my two days of thinking, and he went through all of that through his two days of thinking, and he even asked ChatGPT because <laughs> right, that's what we're doing right now. We're asking ChatGPT, and I'm not going to read the whole answer, but ChatGPT says the same thing that I said as an expert of physics. The tetherball speed increases because of conservation of angular momentum, but he already knew that that brought up a problem of where the energy comes from. Like that's it's something weird. So he even um, he even, at, he even built a pitter ball at his backyard yeah, with his kid. He might an experimentalist. <laughs> <laughs> he was an experimentalist. He wanted to measure. He did the measurements. He was okay with it. He got to it and he shared the experience to the class in a way that showed engagement and puzzlement and like embracing confusion about everyday thinking, about something that we can just come up with uh, in, in everyday thinking. Um, Two other months went by. I just changed to a, a new apartment uh, with a new roommate, and uh, I had a housewarming party. And of course, we are both we both physicists. And what do physicists have in their house? Uh, they have people gathered. 
around the whiteboard. <laughs> in a party on a Saturday night, in a housewarming party, they were talking about it. And if you if you zoom in a little bit, you can see, oh, it's does it, it doesn't really show a lot in the in the picture, but like you can see the terrible question here. <laughs> what, what was funny here is that these were a bunch of great physics grad students doing like Grangian physics to try to solve the problem in ways that they were not being able to really like still grapple with. With the with the questions that the, the responding questions that I was asking them about after they tried to say something about it, it was very 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 engaging. And I don't know if you noticed, but the title of the slides have always been the physics because uh, it, it 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 started questioning myself. What is what is it really? What does it mean to do physics? What does it mean to learn physics? And what does it mean to teach physics? So those were like the core questions that were coming to my mind around this question because I saw a bunch of grad students in physics doing really awesome research and still not being able to confidently or um, uh, easily respond to this question, even though it's a simple physics question. And so I think that was like a little bit of what uh, encouraged uh, me to like engage in this class a, a little bit differently. Uh, now I'm going to let Hugh go and talk a little bit more about the past of how they asked me to be part of this class and why and, and, and other features of what doing physics we think is. Yeah. So, so as you can tell from Miguel's you know, introduction here, this was going to be a really exciting semester. <laughs> and as we were gearing up for it, you know, I, I was really um, you know, eager to get going with it and to be able to share the kind of work that Miguel and I had working through that problem with our students. Um, this this would have this was the fifth or sixth time I taught physics eleven. I taught a number of times over, over five or six years, and the department had realized I, I think the prior year that we needed to fundamentally change the way we teach physics eleven. And we realized that for a couple of reasons. Number one is that the enrollment had just gotten to the point where you could not manage it with one instructor. Okay, it had gone from you know around a hundred to you know close to three hundred. I guess is what we had um, in the fall. And for our department, that would really mean a completely uh, a new thing where we had a team taught course that was going to have to be departmentally managed and not just, you know, this is your course, go, you know, good luck, do your best. Um, so, you know, that was, uh, you know, that was new terrain for our department. And also, you know, just as, as a department and, you know, in particular, some of the conversations on the DEIJ committee, and in particular, with some of our student representatives from the very, very beginning highlighted the important role that these introductory courses had. In shaping students' experiences on arrival to Tufts, and as one of the barriers that was keeping keeping students from considering physics and engineering as majors, um, you know, socially isolating experience, experiencing microaggressions, um, a whole variety of things. So it made it you know, it was kind of a light bulb moment where this is really the place that if you wanted to focus on equity and inclusion, it's a place you're bringing together all of these students for the first time. For, you know, I, I should have said one thing: physics eleven. For those of you that don't know, it's mechanics. All the things that you need to know to do the tether wall problem, and it is a required course for all engineers, and it is a required course for anybody that wants to be a physics major. So, the vast majority of the students that are taking it are in their very first semester in college, and this is a course that they're going to then, you know, they're excited to be in and they're going to build on for the future. Um, just in the equity piece, these students are coming from a tremendous array of high school backgrounds all over the country, every kind of high school you can imagine, all over the world. So, very, very different physics experiences coming into the course. Um, a lot of different resources to build on, um, and you know, again, you know, really trying to um, think more, more, more carefully and intentionally about what inclusion is going to look like in a big class like this. That can often be very intimidating and impersonal, um, and so, you know, this was kind of the place you realize there's a, there's the potential to have a big impact, both in terms of the importance of these two issues in this context for first year students, first semester students, and because of the huge number of students that were involved. So the, the, the department kind of made a decision, we wanted to focus some resources here, we wanted to focus attention here, and I agreed to, to teach it for the next three years together with a co-instructor to, uh, to, be, to be determined. And then, you know, David Hammer, you know, suggested Miguel. Um, and I remember the very first meeting we had was in the summer, and we sat down for the first time, and the very, pretty much the very first question Miguel asked me was, have you thought about ungrading? And I, and I had thought about it because I was part of the reading group here, Although I had to confess, they sent me the book. I didn't attend any of the meetings, but I did read the book. <laughs> so so I, I, would, I, I knew enough about it. To, I knew enough about it to at least, I always feel like if you're reading and they send you the book, you got to at least read the book, right? You know, it's bad enough to not go, but you got to at least read the book, which was great because it was a really, really valuable book. It had a lot of great essays and, and kind of 
made me aware of what ungrading was and the, the vast scope of it. And so I was like, I don't know a whole lot about it, but let's talk about it. And he quickly convinced me that this was going to be the way to go. And so that's now we're back to the first day of class. Yep. Oh, and I, I but I also, yes, I wanted to also say that in terms of the prelude, you know, some of the ideas that that uh, came out of our some of our initial uh, thinking in the department about focusing on equity and inclusion in this class, um, I was actually able to pilot in the spring of 2021 together with a, 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 a P3 partner here through the cell program. And the cell program was hugely valuable. I think Ryan was leading it at the time. Um, and, you know, the, these are not things that we took this semester, but in the spring of 2021, these were some of the things that we took as principles for that of course redesign. And a lot of these we kind of carry forward directly into what we're doing this fall in terms of focusing on a growth mindset, really trying to emphasize, as Miguel said, the doing of physics, the way that we were doing it, and the way our grad, the grad students were doing it, engaging in that collaborative work where you're really grappling with a hard problem, you're doing it with, with other people, you're in, hopefully, even though you're getting frustrated and angry and all those kinds of things, you're having some fun in the process and you want to stick with it long enough to get to the end. Um, and, uh, you know, just the other point here is, is um, just great guidance that I think I got from my colleague, Tim Atherton, that if you're ever unsure on a course design decision, you, you never go wrong by trying to align what you're doing in the class with what you actually do as a day-to-day -day scientist. And that was just such, such simple and powerful advice that I think shaped a lot of the things that we ended up doing here and then carrying into, um, carrying into this fall. You're like a walking advertisement for cell right now. <laughs> there's more. Don't worry. There's more. There's more. So we were thinking. I was thinking so much about ungrading. I was like, "Hugh, we need to go on grading." And he was so on board with it. Very quickly, I was like, "Yay, ungrading! Let's do ungrading." What does ungraded mean? That means many, many different ways. If you read the book, there's many kinds of ways you can ungrade. We kind of went almost all in. Uh, my advisor, David Hammer, says it's not really ungrading because at the end of the semester, you actually have to give a letter grade. Like the university requires us to give a letter grade to the, to the students, and the students are going to have that in mind still, right? It's going to be hard to really ungrade. Um, uh, our ungrading meant the scores were never disclosed, uh, but we did provide uh, solutions to every assessment that we asked them to do, and we tried to provide specific timely and helpful feedback uh, where there's still a little bit of tension with, with what that means and whether we can uh, achieve that completely. But uh, this was basically what ungrading meant for us. At the end, we had to assign a grade uh, the way we did that was that over over the over the course of the semester, uh, they were doing some reflections that he was going to talk a little bit more about uh, later. And at the end, they would do a final self reflection essay in which they would talk about how they uh, they grew, grew throughout the course, and they uh, self recommended a grade. And we would revise those grades and we would uh, sometimes adjust them for the better or sometimes ask to meet with them to adjust them uh, uh, to, to just pro to, for them to just provide more feedback about it. But we basically ended up giving uh, them the grade that recommended themselves uh, at the end. We're going to show a little bit more about that uh, <coughs> later. Yeah, so, um, you know, at the end of the very first week, this was our first assignment was to was to write their own learning goals. And again, these students come from very different environments of education. So we wanted them to really reflect on what their physics background, what experiences they had doing physics, what they saw as their strengths as a learner. Um, and I, I would say in rough numbers, I think that there were, I wouldn't say equal, but very large populations of students who'd had two physics classes in their last two years of high school, who'd had one physics class in their last two years of high school, and they had zero physics classes in their last two years of high school. Those are all very common uh, in this kind of course. And so we adopted learning goals from a colleague, Ben Pollard, who had taught an ungraded physics course, uh, the, the same course at WPI. And we revised it after a lot of discussions here with, with Heather and uh, with Carrie. And uh, it, you know, ask them to reflect on their on their high school experiences, and then to set learning goals for themselves across four dimensions: preparedness, participation, collaboration, and physics understanding. And again, we 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 did, I, at the start of this the semester, I, I was not very fond of these learning goals. I wanted something a lot more rubric like. But as the semester went on, I realized that these were actually the perfect learning goals because. Um, I'm, a, I'm an experimentalist and I work in experimental particle physics. So the smallest project I work on is 50 people and the largest is a thousand. So everything that I do is collaborative. All, you know, it, every, you know, anything research related is collaborative. And the best physics is done by people working together. 
right? The best engineering is done by people working together. So emphasizing that as an important component of what it is to understand physics, what it is to do physics, and what it is to do it at a high level, um, you know, it, you know, this learning goal supports this one. You can't collaborate with people unless when there are times and places when you are expected to turn up to do work together, you're actually there. And you actually did whatever it is they expected you to do to, you know, to be able to engage in the, in the collective work that you're trying to do together. So the, these learning goals are really kind of nested within each other in support of the ability to do physics at a high level, do engineering at a high level, and do well with other people in ways that support their ability to, to do it as well and to do it, um, you know, and do it fully. So uh, some of you might be asking uh, or thinking about if we didn't grade, what did we do? How did we structure the class? The structure of the class was basically like changing a little bit the language of, that we use to approach uh, an active learning, a flipped classroom. Uh, we, instead of calling them lectures, we call them facilitations because we thought of them as spaces in which we were facilitating them talking and doing physics instead of us lecturing about physics. Uh, we changed the uh, this, uh, the recitations to like because nobody recites at a recitation. And we changed them to discussion sections in which they were discussing with their TAs. Uh, labs were still done uh, in the similar way that Tufts has been doing last for the past years. And we changed the, the 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 language of office hours to help hours because it was not in the office. And we provided a lot of spaces and different identity centers for them to go and talk not only to here and I as instructors but also to. Uh, different uh, PAs and LAs. We had a, an amazing team of LAs that were going to every facilitation and uh, were like listening and eliciting uh, students thinking. Um, and and we we had an amazing team that we worked with. Uh, and 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 again to emphasize the uh, important collaboration that you were talking about. Like we we emphasize it all throughout. And we asked them to work collaboratively on everything except on one kind of assessment that I'm talking I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. And so there was like a seating chart in the lecture hall in which they were like going to sit together by groups so <laughs> to engage in small group discussions that happened through facil and facilitation. And they also worked on the same groups over the discussion section for the PAs. Um, uh, the, the, uh, oh, like a quick overview of how we divided the, the class. It was four units uh, based on the content and material that we were working on the mechanics of the world. Uh, and it was a flip class, a flip classroom in a way that they use Achieve as a platform to watch free class videos and to respond to rich questions uh, before the facilitation and that we will follow up on during the facilitation. Uh, through clicker questions, through poll everywhere, or through like a large class discussion, so small group discussions. And basically one of the key components of the, of the class that we thought of was the homework in which we were not just asking very simple conceptual uh, or like right away physics problems, we're asking problems similar to the terrible question in which they had to uh, go through uh, and try to make sense uh, of, of the physics and, uh, and the world around them. But we also asked them one metacognitive reflective question throughout all the homework. So it was a homework every week and every every homework we were asking them, uh, uh, how did you feel about uh, your your assessment last week? Or um, how did you, uh, uh, we were asking them to think about their previous uh, homeworks or sometimes to give peer feedback to their, uh, to their, to their peers. Uh, there was a particular reflective question that, like, there was a turn, a turn point really, really awesome for them to understand the importance of um, active classroom, which we had them read uh, a, a paper on, a, a small paper on the, like, feeling of learning versus actual learning, which just, like, uh, got them more on board with why we were doing the things that we were doing, which was not about the ongoing, it was more about the active classroom part of it. Uh, the assessments that we had, uh, we didn't call them exams or midterms or tests, we call them solo check-ins. These were the only ones that were actually individual assessments that we asked them to work on their own. Uh, there were multiple choice tests, uh, multiple choice questions, uh, uh, for them to have a, a, a sense of where they stood on each of the unit. Uh, and then reflect on after each of the unit. Uh, we had collaborative assessments that they did over discussion sessions with their TAs, in which we asked them a, a really challenging open-ended question that they uh, had to discuss with their peers and like tell us not only what the solution was, but also like tell us how they thought through and how they reconciled their different perspectives. Because most of the times, like in physics, that happens a lot. 
uh, people have different perspectives and they have to talk and discuss and agree on the flaws or the or the, or the arguments. Uh, and at the end of the course, we were asked at the end of each unit, we we're asking them to, and this is also a, something that we had a lot of help from CELT, um, asking them to uh, uh, give peer feedback on, on the groups they work with over each unit. And at the end of the class, on the, on the end of the semester, on the last homework assignments, they were, they were given feedback. Similarly, we we're asking them to give feedback to their peers in a similar way to we to how TAs were giving them feedback throughout the semester, uh, based on the uh, on how they made sense of the problems and how, and, and the solutions that we provided. Um, uh, we did not disclose any of these scores to them, as I said before, but we did uh, we did have information about how many correct answers they had in the solo check-ins that were multiple choice questions. This was the only one in which you actually had a number that we could assign to their, to their responses because of it being multiple choice questions. And you can see that like uh, the out of 10, uh, this, the, the tests were challenging, were difficult, uh, and they had a, a similar curve uh, for, for each of them in a way that, um, that traditional courses also Used, used to have. You can see the first test, the first solo check-in was a little bit more uh, skewed to the right to having more correct answers. We think it's maybe because of the previous experiences that you already have, because the first, the first uh, unit is about things that usually students already have seen in, 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 uh, in high school before. Um, the maybe Oh yes, okay. Yeah, I'm going, yeah. I'll just I'll just jump jump in here. Um, I think Miguel mentioned the things that are sort of on the left here. I mean, the students knew that this that, that we were teaching this course right for the first time, and you know we let them know we were open to feedback, open to questions. <laughs> They're being asked to reflect on their work a lot. They're being asked to provide um, look at work of their peers and and comment on that, both in terms of their physics reasoning and also, but also in terms of their effectiveness to work in these collaborations. Um, and that's kind of a process that they were continuously engaged in over the course of the semester, all the way through to that final reflection. But along the way, there were also a lot of opportunities for them to give feedback to us about how the course was going. And um, that's great. And it's also, you know, has its downsides because you're having to deal with all this feedback that you're getting. We wanted to do an initial climate survey just a couple of weeks in to get a sense of how students were feeling about the climate class. And they misinterpreted the question to be a question of tell us anything you think about this class. Mm -hmm. We had like a massive ride on our hands and they're like, why aren't you lecturing? Basically, it was like, why are why do I have to listen to other confused students when I could be listening to the professors who know everything? And so we had the, you know, that was part of the management of the expectation and the experiences of these students. And um, it, there was a big, you know, sort of a wildfire here right at the beginning of the semester that we had to kind of get under control as the, as the semester went on. And as Miguel said, that, that reading that they did midway through that exposed them with some of the research about it was kind of, I think, the turning point for a lot of students. And in, in their midterm reflections, I saw a lot of things like, um, this course is strange and it's weird and it's not what I was expecting, but I've decided to just trust that you know what you're doing and I'm just gonna do my best. And we're kind of like, okay, that's, that's, <laughs> that we're happy with that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that, we're gonna take that. Um, but, uh, you know, so we got, you know, survey and, and, and huge, huge quantities and high quality uh, uh, information from the students. We did a midterm survey and again, got great advice um, from Heather and Carrie about, you know, about some of the questions about demographics and the language there. Um, and, um, and then, you know, had, had some, Miguel had some separate meetings to talk with students outside of class, pizza, um, pizza meetings where students wanted to come and talk more about the philosophy or the research behind the class and come and join them. Um, and then, of course, at the very end, we had the standard test course evaluation, which we didn't adapt in any way. So we, when we wanted to ask our own questions, we asked them in sort of these other places. And I would say the big picture takeaway of that, of, the, of all of this, was that students, you know, when they expressed uh, dissatisfaction with the course, it was for all the reasons you would expect and that we all see anytime we try to teach in an active learning format. Um, but that uh, the grading for, format was really a minor note in, in, in the feedback they provided. They just seemed ready to just kind of go with it. Um, you had to kind of look, dig through a lot of comments to even find issues, you know, where places where students were either, either even raising at all. So um, the students just seemed to be willing to kind of, you know, go with that. And, um, you know, it loomed large in my mind because it was the new thing. But for the students, it just, 
you know, they, they didn't seem to be, um, you know, ha have, uh, be, you know, be struggling with that, uh, that aspect of it as we, as we kind of went through here. And there's some data, we could, we, we could skip this for now, but, you know, if we want to come back and, and, and talk about that, we can look at it. I, I want to read a couple of student quotes that are, that like, just, uh, were, were very interesting. The second one here, uh, students saying, I hated being confused. I wanted everything explained to me and I needed to have it perfectly fall into my brain. Thoughts about this, uh, throughout this course, I have come to real, the, real, the realization that confusion is beautiful, motivating, and most importantly, necessary. That quote for me, like, it just stuck with me because we were talking all the time about how it was good to embrace confusion and, like, just, like, uh, be okay with and articulating your confusion in different ways. Uh, there was another, there was another quote here, the first one, I really dislike the structure and grading system of this course. I've always enjoyed a solid number that was representative of my achievement. With the conclusion of this course, I have realized that the feedback is actually one of the most important things that have fostered my learning in previously new environment. Uh, so it's like how much we focused on feedback instead of the scores that they were given, they were having. By the way, uh, this is a QR for the slides if you, ever, if you wanna have them later on uh, for to read a, a little bit through more of this score, uh, more of this um, quotes and other things that we, we have. Uh, just uh, to, to, to almost finish, this, these were the grade distributions. Uh, uh, the blue uh, columns represent the grades that they recommended themselves at the end of the final self-reflection. Uh, and the red ones are uh, the ones that we ended up assigning them based either on we thinking that they uh, did more work that they were uh, showing uh, justification for, or because we met with them at the end and talked about to have a, 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 a more clear uh, insights about the evidence that we're, that we're, that we're suggesting. Uh, just as a note, you can see that uh, we ended up giving, it seems like we ended up giving less A's at the end, but at the same time, we ended up giving more A pluses. Um, we, we, we saw many students who were giving themselves uh, A minuses or even some B's that were like, dude, you, you, you achieved all your learning goals uh, and, um, and you did awesome work and you were collaborating, participating, preparating all the time and your understanding of physics is definitely more than what you're saying here it is and so this was the the the, the great distribution that we can talk a little bit more about and discuss maybe with some questions or uh discussion later on did, did you just want to say a little bit about the process by which we kind of got our own sense of how students were doing me with the section coaches and all that oh so so we we didn't only uh ask them to reflect we also asked uh lab tas uh, uh, the discussion section TAs, uh, the LAs to give us a one or two sentence summary of what they thought about the students. And, and we asked some of the TAs to be like, if, if you want to say that I wouldn't give the student less than an A, uh, you can just like say that you like convey a point. Uh, but we were, we, we, we took into account, we were, we were monitoring students' engagement with the course all throughout. And so we have, I have this really freaking big spreadsheet with uh, all the, all the uh, solo check-in scores, but also all the participation, like the, 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 the uh, like how much they attended participation, how much they attended the special sections, which basically was 90% on average, uh, which is crazy for an ungraded class. Um, was, was surprising in a really good way. Uh, all the like uh, uh, help hours attendance and all these different comments from all the <laughs> instructional team uh, led us to be able to be like, yes, like uh, I, I agree with your grade, with the grade you're giving yourself and I'm going to give it to you. Or uh, let's talk, let's talk a little bit more. About it. We ended up talking with like, I would say maybe 15 to 20 students out of 285. Uh, so yes, that, that, do you want to add something? No, 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 that yeah, was great. Yeah, and I, so I just, I, you know, I think that there's a, I mean, it feels like the semester just ended, right? And, and uh, we're, you know, right away, we're jumping into a new semester and we're completely swamped with other things. I feel like there's a lot we still have to dig into about, about how the course works. We have a lot of data that we're, I think we're still trying to think about and kind of analyze. And I, and I feel like in terms of the, like the big picture components that we're describing that, you know, Miguel, you know, kind of described here in terms of the focus in the course on sense making 
but the emphasis on doing it in, a, in, in collaboration with other students and, you know, something that, uh, you know, I, I think we drew very heavily on our colleague, Jason Aldini, in, in teaching one and two and the aspect of social caring and the, the new, you know, the, the, these things all interact with each other, sometimes in complicated ways. And I think the ungrading, although it didn't really seem like much to the students, I think it, it very dramatically changed the impact of a lot of these other pieces and how they interact with each other. For instance, it's a lot easier to, to, to demonstrate care for your students when you reach out to them when they haven't turned in a homework, when it's an ungraded course, as opposed to, I need to remind you that the homework is 25% of your grade and you haven't turned in the last three. So it, I think it, there's some care mentioned we were talking about this a little bit before, although it's, it's sort of like, it seems in some ways like it's a seasoning or it's a, just a, a small ingredient in the dish. I think it totally transforms the way these things interact with each other. You know, all of which we're trying to do in, in a context where we're thinking about, how, you know, doing these things in an inclusive way, in an equi equitable way across all these dimensions. Uh, again, I'm a first year PhD student, so I have four, five, six years <laughs> ahead of me of research. So I have like plenty of data that I can, that, uh, these are like some of the questions that I'm thinking about maybe uh, trying to answer later on by analyzing this data in many ways. Uh, particularly, I'm very interested in how people uh, assess themselves and how do I, how do they assess the quality of their understanding and their work uh, compared to how maybe traditional or traditional grading courses, not necessarily traditional lecturing courses, but like grading courses uh, do and how, uh, how like in, in which ways we can see evidence of them learning and what this, again, the first questions uh, from the parable of the pitiful, uh, what does it mean to learn physics and what does it mean to teach physics and what does it mean to grade and what does it mean to, to, to ungrade? Well, yeah, and I just, you know, and I just want to say thank you. I mean, Heather and Carrie, you met with us probably half a dozen times in the summer and, and several times during the semester. And in particular, when we were kind of stuck and worried about what to do next, and we, we, we felt like there was some conversation going on that we wanted to make sure we got right. We often reached out to Carrie and Heather on short notice and like, we got to send an email tomorrow. What's the best way? And they, they were just fantastic. Um, and together, they actually did Kamar, the former, he's still in the area, he's an engineer. Every once in a while, he's like, you know, how, how's, how are things going at Tufts? Or, you know, we still so we he, we met with him a couple times over lunch and talked about how things are going. Um, and uh, as you said, we, we we drew a lot of what we did this first iteration from Ben. Um, he came and gave a colloquium in our department like the third week of the semester. And his advice was, if you want to do the ungrading, don't change everything at once. <laughs> at that point, we had already changed. <laughs> <laughs> the minute we he said all on it, the girl and I were on opposite sides of the room. We looked at each other. Really? Like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> oh, <my God." laughs> uh, we could have got that advice a little sooner. But, um, <laughs> but it, you know, it, it reminded us that what we were doing was was ambitious and it was challenging, and that we needed to keep our eye on the ball, which, um, which I think we were able to do. Um, obviously, this draws a lot on the physics education research group at Tufts. Things that David Hammer and Vasaldini have been doing in their courses for a lot of years, a lot of things that we've learned from other STEM faculty through conversations in South and other places, and just a ton of people. And I and I probably didn't even get all the names on here of people that we met with over the summer or benefited from conversations with. So it was great. You know, we've had that, you know, student meetings at the identity center. That's always a, a really important component for a lot of students. Um, and just met with a lot of people partly to just let them know what we were doing and understanding the, how it might impact their work in ways that we were going to be, you know, supporting each other in it. Um, and, you know, look forward to continuing to talk with, you know, as people here about what we're doing and you know, try to make it better in the next years. So thank you. We're going to do Q&A in a minute, but I just want to jump in with the first question, because um, I know you, you are um, teaching the same group of students in second semester physics, and I just, if you could say a word or two about, do you feel like they're as prepared as you've seen them before coming out of physics one, and do you feel like doing now the second semester <clears throat> with just you and not this amazing teaching team, if, if you're noticing any differences or struggle points or things that are still working? Well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm teaching the second semester of the sequence, and I think, you know, the course evaluations are one thing, but students vote with their feet, and, the, you know, the enrollment in the class went from 100 to 200. And um, as I told Carrie, there was, I wasn't quite sure if I was going to do the ungrading, because I wanted to see the whole semester play out before I, I knew that I was going to do that, but I did let students know that I was inclined to go that way if things continue to go well. And I think, 
the ungrading component played a role in that, but I, I think just overall the shift in the learning environment, the focus, I think I think is important. I've never taught this at the 11 and 12 back to back, so it's a little bit hard to say, but I think the students are just as prepared as they've been. And more importantly, they're prepared to kind of do the work that we're talking about here, where they're you know grappling with the ideas and expressing confusion and um, you know, engaging in conversations with their um, with other students and things like that. About a quarter of the class are uh, tested out of 11 in high school. So trying to get them, mm. uh, the main advice I've been able to give them is like talk with the other students, everything's gonna be fine. Just calm down, you know, they'll, they'll let you know that it's all gonna work out and just, you know, try to have fun and, and, and do your best. Um, but, uh, I, but yeah. I, I wanna add something to that. And is that uh, the first, uh, like like uh, the, the people I, I'm so thankful for and really, really grateful about are the, like we were very lucky with the teaching team, the TAs yeah. that we had. Uh, because they were all very, very on board with everything that we were doing in a way that like we could not have done it without them being so on board and so like really devoted to it. And particularly this one one TA that was there last semester, uh, Zoe Snyder, that uh, uh, I, I, I really appreciate a lot. Hugh telling, like asking for, for, for them to take instead of two sections, only one section and take care of a lot of the logistics of the course that I was maybe taking a little bit more on. And so I think uh, like it's not that they don't like they don't have the the team that we had. I think they still have a really great team, and they still have all, all some of the other TAs doing it. amazing. How, how many? Yeah, yeah, we're working with you. Uh, seven, six. Yes, oh, a lot. six. Yeah. Discussion yeah. TAs. Oh, okay. Discussion TAs, and like. I don't know how many lab TAs lab, lab labs are physics 11 and one which means a total of like 600 students. So, and, and we did not, we, we had some aspects of the lab be uh, involved in the course throughout the semester, but we were not really like managing the labs. We, we knew what they were doing, we were not managing it. So I'm not sure how many TAs, but there were a lot. Yeah. And then 10, 12 LAs. And, and yeah, we had like six LAs each. So, um. I saw that you had like five students. It looked like get a grade that you know like C minus or below, um, or four even. No, this is this is not D or F. Mm. This is uh, uh, blue self recommended means they didn't hand in a final self reflection or in their self reflection they decided not to give themselves a grade. They were like, okay. I give give me whatever you think, <laughs> uh, and 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 this this for. <laughs> means uh, mostly incomplete or no grades. Right. So as soon as, uh, as soon as I didn't engage throughout the semester, we just decided we talked to them and we were like, you did like you were not here because of other aspects and, and like it's totally fine for that. But like we, we, we think a no grade is better for you or like some students were finishing uh, after so we ended up giving them incompletes. That that's what other means. Yeah. So what was I was gonna ask uh, you know what was your incomplete or drop rate and how does that compare to other semesters? Good question. I remember maybe three or four students dropping. That low. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's why it went to. It had a different sign from previous years, where typically there's some attrition at the beginning. There were students who were adding, you hmm. know, in the first couple of weeks, yeah. you know, more than more than dropping. So, uh, I think I, 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 I think I had one student in my section drop during it, the semester. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I am TAing for one student that I remember being on the list for, for some weeks and then it, he dropped at, at, yeah. at, uh, in the middle. Uh, I don't have statistics for last semesters, to be honest, okay. to compare. Yeah. But I imagine that sounds like probably lower. I think so. Yeah. Well, also, I'll, I'll mention something because, you know, some of the conversations we had with the academic deans were about, you know, particularly as these students are in their first year, like, how do we, how do we know if these students need more support beyond what you're able to provide in their class? Mm -hmm. And I think you know, having taught this course five or six times, this was by far, by far the most closely attentive I've ever been in a big class to how students were doing day by day, week by week. Um, typically, my attitude was, you don't want to put a lecture fine, you know, you'll then you'll get what you're going to get, right? And 80s B, 90s A, and, you know, here are the exams, you know, let's just, you know, and they then end up on the radar screen of the deans when they fail the first exam, right? And um, this was, required close attention to how students were doing. And if students didn't hand in the homework Friday night, 
They got an email from me to Miguel or I Saturday morning just saying, hey, we're just checking in. Are you doing okay? We know if you didn't turn in the homework. Yeah. And that was the way we were able to identify students that we felt needed some support beyond. They were <laughs> answering our emails. They weren't getting back to section coaches. There were students that were obviously dealing with things and they sometimes were honest with us about it. And we were able to kind of work on some course. <laughs> and students that, that weren't, we then directed them to, you know, contacted, you know, the, the, the dean and they, they had follow-up conversations with them. But um, I felt like students were, uh, you know, in, in general, better able to manage some of the stresses and the turbulence of that first semester, just knowing that this course had some flexibility built into it that didn't make them worry about every single grade or every assignment. So. I was honestly surprised that they were doing the work. <laughs> I, was, like, I knew a lot of them were going to do the work, but I was honestly surprised that most of them were doing the work. And the ones who were not doing the work, it was not because it was a grade, it was because they were going through things. Mm -hmm. Mitch? This is awesome. Based on something you just said, can you comment a little bit about sustainability of this type of a model mm -hmm. and resource intensiveness? Go for it. Well, this is something we talked about very, very that same very first meeting we met because you know it was. I mean, it's a two things. Number one, we want this to be a course that can be departmentally managed and run. So with the idea that maybe there are two instructors, one of whom you know they, they don't all both cycle out at the same time. But that one of them might just be a rank and file faculty member, but that the other one has some training in PR, mm -hmm. right? To kind of maintain the, you know, the momentum and the kinds of things that that um that, that Miguel was describing and drawing on the expertise of the PR group. But I said, you know, none of this is gonna work unless this, this can be sustainable with people other than ourselves. And I, I we have a long way to go on that, to be honest with you. But I think in some of the conversations that I have with other people in the department, everything that you're gonna do has to be ready in the summer. Every assignment, every homework, every last mm -hmm. little thing. Because you don't have time to be doing that during the semester. You're just managing the student conversations. You're managing the teaching team. Um, so I feel like if the, if, if the department was able to kind of take it, and obviously once you taught it, you have a whole bunch of things that can roll over. Mm -hmm. But kind of managing all the instructional resources at a departmental level and having more people involved and making sure they're all prepared and ready to go when the semester starts, I think that, I, I think there's at least a possibility there that this could be a sustainable model if, if you have that place. One thing that we had a lot of help uh, with was coming up with the problems, with with re with real life scenarios. Let's think about everyday thinking problems that came from David Hammer. Right, mm -hmm. like we did not have to think of a bunch of problems that actually yeah. uh, tested <laughs> actual like physics discussions instead of just like what's a great answer. Uh, and 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 we are thinking about that maybe maybe uh, so again. PhD student here thinking about my dissertation, that one thing that could come out from it is uh, structuring an, an, an open source uh, uh, structure version of how we did this and uh, the particular material that we used and, and the solutions that we gave and maybe coming up with our own uh, pre-lecture videos uh, that are, are, are done in a more uh, diverse way that are not just the, this <coughs> white physics professor talking truths, <coughs> but more like let's think about everyday thinking yeah yeah i just I want to add, add some add, come back to what someone else said so this this was this was the part of the very first conversation is making sure that we're doing something that's sustainable here at us but also realizing that everything we're talking about here is so important and it's there's so many ways in which physics instruction across the country across the world could be improved and just realizing that if you can't succeed in doing something like this here at Tufts with all the people that we have and all the expertise we have and all the resources we have and the students that we have, it's getting hard to do it anywhere. So we really wanted to try to have something and at least a set of ideas that you could take and, repl and try to replicate other places. And so that's why I'm so grateful to be working with a PER scholar and have the opportunity to you know, share with the world some of the things that we're learning and we think are working and what we're doing. I want to say a little bit more about like how important collaboration was for us and I think how, how I think uh, <clears throat> this can be done without all this instructional team and just taking advantage of having the course done with students. If students be part of the doing of the course. The anonymized peer feedback at the end was so helpful for, for, for them to see each other's perspectives and how they were solving the problems and give each other uh, uh, feedback based on, on, on the material that we were giving them. I think, I think this can be done with students. Uh, in, in a way that is sustainable for any 
teach her anywhere. Yeah, you're 